Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Desiree Dembski-Hamlin, and I am joined by my colleagues Jeremy Price, Kenneth Kirkland, Kelly Fenton, and Brett Gallagher. Together we are New Leaf Consultants, and we are here today to present Powering Forward, a vision for the Turner's Falls Canal District. sought New Leaf services to gain a fresh perspective on a redevelopment strategy for the Turner's Falls Canal District. The district is a narrow spit of land bounded on the north side by the Connecticut River and on the south side by the Power Canal. The district has been designated as a slum and blight area. Because the site was not designed with the Ottoman deal in mind, access and circulation challenges exacerbate the difficulty of attracting investors. Aging infrastructure and virtually no on-site parking only adds to this problem. In order to seek public and private investment, the client needs to have a vision plan in hand. The client has asked New Leaf to create a conceptual vision plan which will include a brand identity, plans of uh, elements of a district plan, and we've been asked to identify public infrastructure um, and necessary investments. We have been asked to collaborate with the UMass Design Center, who you'll see many of their drawings further in the presentation. We will, uh, this plan also includes recommendations and an implementation plan for the client to carry forward. Some goals of this project were to reintegrate the district, district which has been cut off from downtown by the Power Canal with the, with the downtown, as well as connect the people who live there with the Connecticut River. In doing this, we need to honor the historical and cultural roots of the area. So a little bit about Turner's Falls. Uh, Turner's Falls is one of five villages in the town of Montague. Montague is located in Franklin County, uh, which is located in the upper Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, Franklin County is actually the most rural county in all of Massachusetts. Downtown Turner's Falls sits at the cross crossroads of Interstates 91 and Route 2. It's about a 10 minute drive from Greenfield, which is the only city and rural urban area in Franklin County and it's within the 25 minute drive of the cultural hubs of Northampton, Amherst, and Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, while there's evidence of Native Americans inhabiting the area for thousands of years, Turner's Falls has really developed as a planned industrial community in 1867. And as you can see, in the white outline here, this is, um, this is the site that we're currently talking about as it existed in the 1870s. The village quickly became known for its paper, cutlery, and textile mills. As industry left in the mid-20th century, Turner's Falls was hit very hard economically. Today, the town, local business people, and community members are working hard to uh, rebuild a sustainable economy. You can see here we have uh, loot. This is a store um, that it, the owners live right above um, there. And they have worked really hard to uh, foster more community in, in Turner's Falls. We also have places like the Rendezvous that attracts visitors for uh, musical shows uh, many nights of the week. Turner's Falls hosts events such as the annual Franklin County Pumpkin Fest that attracts visitors from across the region. The town has also invested in redeveloping and enhancing public amenities and recreational opportunities. Turner's Falls is home to the Great Falls Discovery Center, which is owned and operated by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. The center offers excellent programming that highlights the natural, cultural, and historical resources of the area. So having lived there for the past year and a half, I'm really proud to call Turner's Falls my uh, first real home away from home. So I'll give you a brief socioeconomic profile of the area. Um, you can see here that we have declining school, uh, we have a decline in younger people. And this is reflected in declining <coughs> school enrollment numbers, which is still happening even into 2016. You can also see that there is, um, we have an aging population, which is also reflected in Franklin County as a whole. 
Uh, there is an interesting uh, growth here in the people in the 45 to 54 um, year old age group, and I think that this is reflected of uh, business owners coming into town and they're living there and they're there's entrepreneurial um, uh, being at that point in their lives. As I mentioned, the area was hit hard by the decline of industry, which is reflected in the median household income over the past 30 years. So while Turner's Falls is significantly lower than the state and the county, we are seeing a bit of an upswing. And perhaps most interesting is the real switch in educational attainment of people over the age of 25. Uh, we went from, in the 1990s, uh, almost double the amount of people uh, only had high school degrees, and now we're seeing that reverse in bachelor's degrees. So I will now pass this on to um, Fred to discuss existing conditions of the site. So now let's uh, briefly talk about the site, site's context, and the general area of uh, the downtown Turner's Falls area. So here we have the canal district, which is highlighted in um, the red on uh, the island that's waterlocked. We also have the downtown area, which has uh, multiple mixed years of residential and commercial. We also have um, a canal side rail trail that was um, built recently in 2008. It's about three and a half miles, and it also connects into Deerfield. We also have multiple recreational areas, such as the Discovery Center. Um, we also have the Unity Park and the Skate Park that was also recently built, and the Peskamoska Park. Uh, we also have more residential continue on the southern end of the site, which is uh, the Patch neighborhood. We also have the Hill um, neighborhood of more residential as well. Uh, now we'll talk about the site inventory, uh, which is site specific. Uh, we have uh, the northern end of uh, the recreational area of the first lake open space. Next we have a vacant in deck property of the current mill uh, silo and the, um, the, the footprint of that building. We also have a vacant Strathmore mill complex, as well as the Strathmore building number 11 vacant as well. And then we continue more down to the Turner's Falls paper and the Housing and Redevelopment Authority and the railroad salvage yard, which is vacant, as well as the railroad salvage yard annex, which is also vacant. Uh, now I'll talk specifically about the bridges. On the northern end, we have the IP bridge, mostly used uh, to connect to the northern end of the site of the recreational, so it's mostly pedestrian oriented. Uh, we also have the, Strat the important Strathmore pedestrian bridge that is um, completely closed. It's been closed for a long time, but it's an important gateway to the site. We also have the Fifth Street Pedestrian Bridge, as well as the uh, adjacent Fifth Street Bridge used for vehicular traffic, as well as the White Bridge. We also have uh, the defunct Sixth Street Bridge and the adjacent uh, vehicle with Sixth Street Bridge. Uh, one of the main pertaining issues of the site is the limited access and circulation of the site. In this picture here, you have the Canal Road, which is a minimum uh, of a 10 feet narrow roadway, which is only really used by uh, Turner's Falls Paper to back in and out of delivery trucks, which in between uh, the Fifth Street Bridge and White Bridge, White Bridge, uh, it queues traffic and is a very big mess of congestion traffic there. Also, there's no currently no on-site parking. Uh, another pertaining issue is the Asian infrastructure. Here is the Strathmore Pedestrian Bridge, uh, which is a very, it's the lifeline of the site pretty much, and it goes with the redevelopment of the site. So we need to keep this here and reinvest into it, and this is uh, where all the utilities cross to the Canal District side. Um, so with the access and Asian infrastructure, it really exacerbates the issue of redevelopment to the site. Data collection, uh, we have looked at a range of uh, research from the town of Montague, plans reports, studies done by the town of Montague, as well as uh, private engineering firms. We've also looked at previous law report activity for further guidance, uh, Dr. John Mullen, and uh, also um, Terry Garrett and Jen Stromson's thesis. We've also looked at peer reviewed articles, as well as case and precedent studies to further our recommendations when uh, framing, framing our recommendations for our, our um, district vision plan. We've also, uh, we will be completing a uh, financial uh, analysis, uh, including a fiscal impact analysis, a performance and a tax yield per acre to help understand uh, the costs, the tax revenues, and the financial um, projections really uh, for the site when redeveloped. We've also had a, a large laundry list of site visits. Went to, uh, in Massachusetts and Vermont, we went to uh, the Belboro uh, Cotton Mill, which had uh, a lot of maker spaces and incubator spaces. 
Um, also, mill number five, Lowell Mass. We uh, we saw a lot of uh, beautiful retail and studio and studio uh, uh, spaces, as well as the East Works and East Hampton with large event spaces and um, uh, living work lofts. And then, lastly, for our data collection, we did we conducted a stakeholder interview. Out of the 12, nine responded, and these were mostly property owners and uh, a developer on site. <coughs> and most of these general questions were issued, uh, what, what were the issues and the feelings and concerns for redevelopment of the site? So now I will talk, uh, give it over to Kelly to talk about the district vision. Thank you, Brett. All right, so this first part of what the client is asking for is to come up with a district vision that's really going to drive things um, powering forward. Um, so the canal district vision includes revitalizing buildings, retaining historic character, providing mixed uses, fostering entrepreneurship, providing public gathering space, and also providing recreational access to the river. Uh, in terms of revitalizing buildings, um, we're speaking of activating these buildings. A lot of these buildings on site are not being used now, so part of revitalization is making sure that that happens. Uh, that's the first step. Um, they've done this in Lawrence. Uh, the Mill 180 in East Hampton is also a great example of um, the activation of this space. Uh, retaining historic character is an important element of this. That's happened in a lot of other mill redevelopment projects, such as uh, East Works in East Hampton, and again, Mill 180 in East Hampton. Uh, retaining this character architecturally both inside and out in terms of the brickwork, the exposed beams, the exposed inner workings of the building uh, this is an important element of our, of our vision. Incorporating mixed use. So this includes light industry, it includes um, commercial activity, also uh, residential. There's a large amount of square footage in these buildings, so a lot of these uses can be accommodated without conflict. Uh, fostering entrepreneurship. Uh, this, the Cottonville and Brattleboro, Vermont has um, a circus <coughs> school. Um, Gateway City Arts has, in addition to the arts, um, the arts art activity they have also, um, also brunch and a beer garden. Improving river access. In East Hampton, this is the Connecticut River, um, so active and passive recreation. And here in our site, so there's beautiful views, um, the mill buildings um, view out the back view the Connecticut River and this lovely, uh, lovely nature. So it's a matter of accentuating all of these assets of the site. Uh, and all this is, um, their vision is to serve the local community. There's a diverse range of people, um, Native Americans, veterans, um, skilled workers, uh, and artists. So we want to make sure that we're serving um, this community in terms of uh, responding to their values, uh, reflecting their values, and responding to their needs. <coughs> Providing um, public gathering space is also an important element. Um, so how do we do this in terms falls? We have some ideas for how to operationalize the vision, and I'm going to show you some ideas we have in terms of a six-month time frame, one-year time frame, as well as a three- to five-year time frame. Uh, six months, uh, developing a logo, developing signage. Here's a couple examples from Lawrence and East Hampton that do a great job of saying, here, here's what we are, here's where we are. Uh, also developing a logo would be installing a wayfinding system. In Lowell, they have these great um, signs um, along a trail that, um, that tell a story of the, um, the mill history, um, the cultural history, as well as the natural history. This kind of thing can be installed um, in the canal district as well. Um, ideally along the, um, the existing um, canal um, rail trail and our proposed um, spur off that, off, that, off that trail on our site. Within one year, uh, we think the establishment of Native American cultural park can happen at the north end of the island. It's already a park, but it's just a matter of um, kind of making it a more established area for people. Uh, one way we would do that would be to have a community event that helps to activate that area and bring people there. Three to five years, uh, new tenants. So there's already been an accepted proposal for uh, the development of one of the buildings for, um, for artist live workspaces. And also, um, uh, Crab Apple um, Whitewater Rafting Company is interested in having um, in operating on the site specifically. They already operate down uh, down the river, and they want to expand their business and have a site um, at, in the canal district. Uh, this is um, one example of what could be done in order to help activate the site. So this is the uh, bike trail right now. 
and we are proposing creating a node, um, at a node at, at a an important intersection that brings people from downtown Turner's Falls, um, creates a gathering space for people, and there would be signage that um, kind of directs people across this bridge, um, across the canal, onto our site. Um, to talk more about how the details of how this plan can happen, I'm going to pass it off to Ken. So again, the district plan is going to turn around and take all of those ideas from the district vision. We actually want to take around, take it out, and make it actually work in reality. So one of the questions that our client had, had asked us to do was to look into how applicable PUD would be for this particular site. And so it's a lot of the uses that we're looking for in terms of getting some of the mixed uses in together, addressing the local innovation, adventure tourism, a lot of things that were addressed within the district vision could be addressed through PUD. In particular, it's the flexibility of PUD is what really makes it an attractive option for this site. And also because PUD, you can, you can customize it to reflect the needs of the district. And as mentioned before, parking was an issue, access was an issue, and overall circulation is an issue. And also, one of the great things about PUD, we also suggest of doing phase development as part of it because of the, you've seen the size of the Strathmore Mill in particular, it's, it's sheer size is a little bit, is a, would be almost too much to have it uh, developed all in one shot. So what we would do is part of, as part of our development process, we would suggest selective demolition as an initial part of our phase development, which would be able to cut down some of the square footage of the building itself, so all of the material that was around here would open it up. There's an existing loading dock that's right here, which would be able to accommodate in the industry that we have, that we would suggest as part of our overall mixed use design. So the, the selective demolition is able to not only reduce the square footage of the building itself to make it a little bit more manageable for the client and the developer, but it also yeah, it's able to the selective demolition keeps the historic character that we've been that the client has asked us to do for this whole project. So as in addition to that, what we have is the the mixed uses, the mixed land uses that we've been asked to incorporate, uh, kind of goes along a gra uh, goes along a gradient from north to south. So we'll have kind of the open space up to the north. I have a mixed use here at the Strathmore Mill. This is the new footprint of the building as we had, as we had seen in the previous rendering. This is Turner's Falls paper, which is gonna remain the industrial aspect as it is. And the Franklin the uh, Regional Housing Authority would suggest possibly getting rid of a, uh, reducing the square footage of that building as well to keep the historic, to keep the historic structure that's there, renovate it properly. And that is one of the few sites that has a very good frontage on a, on a public street and has uh, adequate parking spaces available. And then we would also have the uh, railroad salvage yard, the main building, and also the small annex building, which would be incorporated as part of all of this. And as you can see here, the gateways that we have identified, here's the IP bridge that we had talked about in the previous uh, couple slides earlier regarding the, the node for getting people onto the district. The Strathmore pedestrian bridge right here, which would be redesigned, and also the southern gateway at the end of the railroad salvage yard area. And all these uses would, would talk to the did the vision of first of all addressing the adventure, the local innovation at, in the beginning as to, as part of the uh, mixed uh, like uh, mid scale commercial, like industrial, some market rate residential, which we'll explain a little bit afterwards, and also the adventure to the adventure tourism is really going to be uh, activated with the open space up to the north and the cultural park adjacent to it as well. And also one of the big things that we've been asked to do is create a circulation plane because of the limited parking space and uh, access overall. One of the big opportunities that we had here was that the existing rail trail, as, as it runs, uh, runs along the eastern side of the uh, eastern side of the district, we figured that using the node up at the northern end as, a, as an area to extend, the, to extend the rail trail to incorporate the entire district, which would then, uh, we couldn't show it because of the, the sheer scale of the picture, but the rail trail would connect, oh, there's, a, there's a small railroad bridge that would be part of the connection, and it would meet the existing uh, rail trail just a little farther south beyond this picture. The massive opportunity that we have here is the FERC relicensing process. The first light is the owner of the power canal, <laughs> and the, first, the FERC process is the Federal Energy Relicensing Commission, which has a 40-year timeline. The last time an opportunity came up like this was roughly around the, uh, about the 70s, and so one of the things that our client had asked us to do was kind of create a list of things that we would ask for which would help with the redevelopment aspect of the area in general. One of the big things is that we had uh, asked for an increase in uh, a permanent public access easement for the northern end of the district. It, create, it opens up river access to incorporate the adventure tourism of crab apple rafting. We also want to have, we would also ask for the easement will allow for that and also the extension of the rail trail itself because there are multiple owners on the site 
getting this process, getting this written down in the easement allows the district to uh, ex allows us to expand the rail trail as we as we propose. And also, one of the big pieces is that the funding of the Strathmore Pedestrian Bridge and its ability to visually connect people to the river as well as physical access, as I mentioned earlier, in the northern end, these kind of opportunities because of the 40-year time because of the 40-year time frame, it's now or never. And I'm going to pass it along to Jeremy, who's going to discuss infrastructure and investments. Thank you, Ken. So I'll be discussing infrastructure and investments. <coughs> so in response to our current climatic condition um, and our responsibility to plan it both as people and planners, we're proposing that the site be retrofitted with sustainable energy technology, such as geothermal systems and photovoltaic. As you can see here, this is an image of a geothermal system. Uh, we are proposing an industrial grade geothermal system be placed into the Powell Canal for the Strathmore Mill Complex will generate a significant amount of energy. Uh, this is a map just showing kind of where we are proposing some of these locations. So this is the only water-based location. Uh, everything else could be more traditional in round closed loop systems. As far as uh, photovoltaic is concerned, there's a significant amount of roof uh, square footage and we should maximize on that and really kind of help supplement this geothermal system and, and reduce our dependence on non-renewable sources. Uh, generally speaking, these are very flat roofs and have great southern exposure for maximum uh, So the Whiting Mill in Northbridge, Massachusetts is kind of the perfect amalgamation of these uh, combinations of geothermal systems and hydroelectric, including photovoltaic. They've received over $3 million from the United States Department of Agriculture Rural Development, uh, and it is a commercial, residential, and there's a lot of community space here too. Uh, so this is something that we kind of have been referring to. While we can't incorporate hydroelectric, uh, maybe it's a potential down later on the road. Uh, there are a ton of improvements that need to be made for the site. Uh, and first and foremost is the Strathmore Pedestrian Bridge. As Brett has already discussed, it is the linchpin to the site. Uh, and without its success and the provision of utilities, it really the, the Canal District would really kind of cease to exist as well. This is a potential uh, rendering of the bridge, and it is a 210-foot single truss span bridge, uh, and it will cost about $1.2 million. This was originally discussed uh, by Fuss O'Neill in 2008, uh, and it would be a really cool gateway to the city, and we'd like to restore its kind of historical meaning as people coming to and from uh, the site. Another bridge that needs to be reworked would be the IP bridge. Uh, currently, it is only a pedestrian bridge, and if the site is going to accommodate uh, increased activity, whether that be for emergency vehicles, its structural integrity needs to be uh, more evaluated. Um, additionally, another intersection. This is a picture that was uh, included in the livability plan, which is an important document for the Turner Falls Canal District. Uh, so this is just an uh, design, and we uh, recommend that the client uh, conduct real engineering design to see if this is something that would be feasible for the site and handle the potential uh, increased development. Uh, again, this is a, a temporary bridge and from the Army Corps of Engineers and its outreach is lifespan and another bridge that's important needs to be redeveloped. And on the right you see the pedestrian bridge. We hopefully have those combined into one with safe access for cyclists uh, and pedestrians. Uh, so, you know, more traditional infrastructure as far as water and utility. Uh, currently, you can see here, all power comes across the canal to the Turner's Falls Hydro uh, facility, and we believe that for the, the district to be successful, it must be separated from Turner's Falls Hydro, ran over the Turner's Falls uh, pedestrian bridge. And why is this important? Because recently, last month, in uh, Florence, Massachusetts, the Art and Industry Building, they lost power for about a week or so. And there's a lot of manufacturing businesses and trade businesses, and this is a really important time of the year where people are trying to make money. Uh, so to avoid this, uh, that is a, a major selling point for, for our proposed development. Uh, just again, sewer currently, Turner's Falls Paper is an existing uh, stakeholder within the site, and so we do have to work with them. And their uh, sewer outflow from the water treatment facility goes through the Strathmore pedestrian building that needs to be separated. Uh, in addition, on the southern end, uh, all sewer can be connected to existing systems. Um, and obviously, you know, we are primarily composed of water, so drinking water is important. Uh, as you can see here, this is an 8-inch domestic pipe uh, that's currently inactive. We propose that uh, it be replaced uh, with a 6-inch pipe. Uh, and so Turner's Falls is lucky. This is one of the, uh, it's one of the communities in Franklin County that has access to fiber optic broadband. And for you know, companies and or organizations to be successful and compete in, in today's uh, era, you need to have access to that. So the uh, fiber optic comes across the 
white bridge from Greenfield, and we would recommend that it is connected both to the northern and the southern end of the site. And if money grew on trees in Western Massachusetts, <laughs> there'd be a whole lot of it. Um, <laughs> fortunately, that isn't the case. Uh, fortunately, that isn't the case, and uh, you know, investing now is going to save money in the long run. So it's important that you know, we kind of get the ball rolling on this project. We've identified local quasi-governmental, uh, state, and federal funds. You know, at the local level, they could implement district improvement financing. Uh, as Ken has already talked about, FERC is an important uh, stakeholder, and we could really leverage some money to help pay for some of this infrastructure. Mass Development offers a ton of grants, um, some of them, you know, really close and within the, within the area for both infrastructure and kind of community development. Uh, as far as the state's concerned, uh, again, more infrastructure stuff. The historic rehabilitation tax credits have been implemented uh, uh, multiple times by a committed developer to the site over air construction. Um, but in order to get those, the windows would have to be reconfigured to their existing conditions. So a study would uh, be important to see whether the, the benefits gained from those tax credits would outweigh the cost to do so. Uh, and lastly, as the designation as a slum invited area, they, are, uh, they can utilize the community development block grants and USDA Road Development has given a significant amount of money to similar development projects, both for energy uh, and the historic kind of community preservation. Uh, so I'm going to pass it on now to Ken for the conclusion. So, wrap, wrapping this all up into one neat, beautiful, uh, one neat, beautiful pile here. So what we had was a site that was designated as a slum and blighted area, and our client has come to us to ask us, how can we redevelop this site? the best way possible for future developers, but also to maintain the historic character. We want to be able to revitalize these buildings, retain the historic nature, get kind of gather up some mixed use, uh, get some mixed use uh, um, uses within the building, make sure that it fosters the entre entrepreneurial nature of the local area, get, uh, we'd like to provide some public space in the area to get people connected and to create general buy-in from the community. We also want to provide recreational access and to the river itself. We have talked to a ton of people who have been extremely helpful to us, but mostly we would obviously like to thank our client, the Town of Montague themselves, in particular the Planning and Conservation Department, FERCOC, the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, we'd like to thank them too, they provide excellent feedback. Also, we have some of our professional stakeholders, uh, particularly we have Jeff, Wal uh, Je uh, Jeff Lewis and Dutch Walls of the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. They were excellent at helping us kind of figure out uh, what this kind of looks, what a successful project similar to ours looks like. Uh, Joe Heslin is extremely uh, personable and made, made marketing quite interesting and not as bland as it could be. And also, obviously, Jen Stromson has been amazing in keeping us all held together when the glue was starting to come apart. And also, we'd like to thank the UMass Design Center, particularly Michael and Yanwa, for making these excellent drawings that I don't think any of us, perhaps maybe Kelly, would be able to do. Mm -hmm. And also, just you guys here at the department, and also, of course, uh, last but not least, Daryl himself. And that is the end. <laughs> Q&A session, and of course, just going to kind of reiterate what we had before, <coughs> was that we'd like to get commentary from everybody, uh, students and faculty alike, and then just so that we can make sure that everybody gets a say, uh, I'd like to keep try to keep the comments down to about roughly two to three minutes, just so that everybody can have a chance to uh, have their input. So who wants to start? I'd love to start. I think you guys did a great job. Um, much improved and, and lots of new detail from the first half. Um, it, I have actually a question. You interviewed some stakeholders and other folks. Um, what did they say, and how did that change the plan you made? I know it was roughly uh, for some of the stuff that we had. It was roughly split. Um, the town itself, the town itself, is roughly split between tear it all down and make it a huge, enormous park, the most expensive park they would have. And then there was the other half was saying we should keep everything, don't touch it, renovate it, restore it, make it look nice. Obviously, the phase demolition part of that is kind of a compromise between the two of them because we recognize that there's just not enough demand for the supply that we have. So that's the kind of compromise that we have between the two of them. Uh, some of them were saying that it's possible if money were to grow on trees because of the extent, because it's been kind of mothballed for so long that it's going to take a lot of money to just bring it up to code. But then there are some people saying, hell, if you have enough people that want to do it, we have, uh, we market rate housing and the mid-scale commercial is some of the, is actually surprising enough, it's lacking in this area. So they said the amount of demand, the, the demand for that would be able to overcome the initial 
uh, costs for fixing up the area. And I think also um, just talking with stakeholders 